Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg. I'm the publisher of Orbis Books. I'm very pleased to be joined today by uh, one of my favorite authors. I have to say we've worked together for over 25 years on uh, five books. That's Kelly Brown Douglas. Uh, she is a the uh, canon theologian of the National Cathedral in Washington. She is also the dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at uh, Union Theological Seminary, where she also uh, received her doctorate many years ago, uh, working with the great uh, James Cohn, another one of our uh, uh, beloved authors. Uh, her most recent book, and we'll be talking about that today, is called Resurrection Hope, A Future Where Black Lives Matter. And it occurred to me that, uh, Kelly, that in, in all of your books, you have uh, been in a way wrestling with how to reconcile the credibility or the meaning of the gospel in relation to the persistence of suffering, particularly black suffering uh, in, in America. And you have said in a way that your work represents a kind of ongoing journey. And I think that's very obvious uh, in this book. In your, in your previous book, which I think was really a, a groundbreaking book, Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God, that was written after the death of the teenager Trayvon Martin in, in Florida. Uh, and that was an event that also kind of triggered the whole rise of the Black Lives uh, Matter uh, movement. And you responded to that, uh, not just as a theologian, but in a very personal way, uh, as the mother of, of an African-American male teenager. Uh, and so now in your new book, uh, this in a way comes after the death of another Black man, George Floyd, and the uh, you know, depth of feeling that that, that that evoked. And once again, now you're also responding to now questions posed to you very personally, literally, by your now grown uh, son. So I wonder if you could uh, reflect on the journey uh, that you've been on between those two books and where that has led you. Yeah, no, thank you, Robert. And, uh, and as you uh, perhaps exaggerated me being one of your favorite authors, but uh, it is certainly over these 25 or more years uh, been more than a privilege to work with you and now to call you not simply uh, my editor, uh, but my friend. Uh, so between the time, and, and Robert, you know this as, as well as anybody, between the time of the Stand Your Ground and this current book, Resurrection Hope, I really had no intention of writing. Uh, this book, Resurrection Hope, and uh, almost like Stand Your Ground, and it was the journey itself and the questions themselves. And one of the things that became very clear, especially uh, when we bracket this really with uh, my son, who was a teenager uh, during the uh, time of Trayvon Martin's uh, uh, death and murder, uh, and the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. And now uh, he's a young adult uh, and was like 23 at the time of Philandro Castile's uh, death. And, uh, and, and I mark that because it marks one of the discussions and conversations that Desmond and I had. What I realized during this time was not simply how so much had not changed. And it was this ongoing uh, struggle for black lives to matter, at least for the reality that black lives did not really matter uh, in this country to become a part of the collective consciousness and awareness of this country in a different way. But uh, also recognizing the way in which uh, the threat to black lives uh, seemed to intensify. And so that it didn't seem as though things were getting any better at all. And even recognizing sort of the historical patterns that we see, because of course, during the time of writing uh, uh, Stand Your Ground, we had a, a, a black president. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had 
gone from there to, well, the MAGA vision and the mm -hmm. uh, man that we had sitting in the Oval Office who represented so much of what I talked about in Stand Your Ground, white supremacy, Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, et cetera. And so to recognize during that period of time that not only had things not really gotten better, that these realities intensified as mm -hmm. the country did not come to this more collective awareness of the uh, reality that Black lives didn't matter, this collective awareness of the uh, intensity of uh, white supremacy, et cetera, and the threat uh, that that had to uh, Black and Brown lives and bodies in this country but that the country had doubled down mm -hmm. uh, on its founding narrative of white supremacy and Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism and all that goes with it. And in the process that black lives in particular were uh, more endangered. And so during that period, uh, as I recognize the intensity and the change, if you will, that had occurred uh, for the worse, not the better, uh, that, that became even more acute for me because of the questions that my son was asking as he recognized that. Mm -hmm. And so he wasn't willing to continue in this cycle uh, that uh, we found ourselves in, but was asking really the hard question. Uh, it's like, okay, what difference does all of this make? We've had Trayvon, we've had Michael Brown, we've had Philandro, uh, we've had uh, Sandra Bland, now we've got George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor and Auburn Aubrey, mm -hmm. and, and we had a black president and now we have the Mega Man. And so, mm -hmm. you know, to, to hear your child frame those questions, uh, it brings a whole new sense of, for me, mm -hmm. responsibility and accountability as mm -hmm. a mother and as a theologian. And his questions really were my questions and he just mm -hmm. dug them up uh, mm -hmm. from the bottom of my soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in Stand Your Ground, you, you really so persuasively showed uh, how uh, white supremacy was kind of baked into the origins of, of America and the idea of American exceptionalism, the idea that America is kind of white space and that people of color are, are outsiders, they're a threat, they're potentially dangerous, they're potentially criminal uh, and uh, therefore can be targeted uh, with impunity. Uh, and so then, as you say, then we go from that to to, uh, to the whole uh, motto of, of a whole administration with make America great again, uh, and which you show you know, so, so well is, is, uh, is, a, is a, uh, you know, a defense of affirmation of, of that whole kind of white supremacist uh, uh, ideology. Yeah, but one thing that I did not uh, in Stand Your Ground fully appreciate, uh, and really didn't begin to grow into a uh, uh, deep appreciation of it until after I wrote uh, Stand Your Ground and continued to learn on this journey. But what I didn't completely appreciate, Robert, that I spend more time with in this book is the narrative of anti-Blackness, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the reality of anti-Blackness is because what I came to realize even more was that it was about more than simply white supremacy, that there was another uh, narrative, if you will, uh, that was inextricably related to this notion of white supremacy. But one can talk about the superiority of whiteness and not feel this almost instinctive response uh, to the black body. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what I came to recognize even more intensely during this period between uh, the two books was the way in which people were simply responding to the black body. And, and, and that mm -hmm. probably was a new awareness uh, or different level of awareness for me, but it's been there all along. And so what I really came to appreciate was the intense reality in this country 
of uh, anti-blackness. And that when we talk about uh, whether we're talking about white racism, white supremacy, et cetera, we cannot ignore that there is something in particular about the black body mm. that is viewed as an instinctive threat uh, in this country and that the black body itself uh, is under siege, mm. under threat. And so that this reality of uh, racism, white supremacy, that uh, as we talk about that, we can't talk about it simply in these general terms, but we have to recognize uh, the anti-Blackness that is also baked in uh, to this country. And that's what I explore deeply mm -hmm. uh, in this book. Uh, and it also uh, is that really which uh, helps us to understand more deeply why it is important to be able to affirm that Black lives matter, because mm -hmm. this is a response to an anti-Black narrative in this country. It is not simply a response to, let's say, white supremacy. And so for people only to be able to say, oh, well, yes, all lives matter, but that suggests is that you are not, you don't have the ability to say that Black lives in particular matter or that Black life can represent or signal or symbolize all of humanity. And mm -hmm. the reason we can't do that is because we have not come to grips with the reality of anti-Blackness that is baked mm -hmm. in not only into our social, cultural, political environment, but also our theological uh, 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 environment. There are a couple of uh, ideas I want if you could you could talk about a little bit more. You write a lot about a kind of white way of knowing uh, that infects the culture and, or, and 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 the Christian church in, in in many different ways, and also then the problematic role of what you call good white Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, two things, and I'll, I'll I'll try to be briefer in 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 my responses. The other thing, when you talk about the white way of knowing, that I also didn't fully appreciate, sort of my journey and mm. understanding where we are, uh, and didn't fully appreciate, say, in stand your ground, is that there we talk about the legacy, if you will of slavery, and I like to say the legacy of white supremacy. We talk about that legacy in terms of its sort of social political realities, right? Economic realities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But we don't talk about it in relationship, if you will, to its epistemological realities. This, this legacy that is a way of knowing, this legacy that has caused us not only to define knowledge in a certain way, and hence what it is valuable to know, what counts as truth, what counts as knowledge, mm -hmm. but has also shaped the way we see the world, the way we engage history, the way we engage experience, and the way in which we determine what's important Mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so this is a gaze, really, that mm -hmm. has shaped, for lack of a better way of saying it, as I say, our way of knowing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and our way of perceiving. And so that's what I really, again, came to appreciate and to try to sort of unravel and uncover. And in and, and that that gaze, that white way of knowing is mm -hmm. held us, if you will, hostage. And mm -hmm. it has shaped the way we imagine mm -hmm. justice and the way we enact justice mm -hmm. and, and the way in which uh, injustice uh, has emerged. And it, it, it is, it sort of trapped us in this sort of mm -hmm. prism mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of, of cognition and of experience and of perception. And mm -hmm. so it's not, it's, it's, not uh, surprising, for instance, that we have seen such a resistance to uh, quote unquote critical race theory, which many people who resist it don't know what it's about. Mm -hmm, but it's not 
surprising that we have seen a resistance to that because what it really, what critical race theory uh, is really trying to help us to do is to break free from this limited white way of knowing and opening mm -hmm. up uh, mm -hmm. our way of knowing, seeing, and perceiving the world. Uh, in terms of good white Christians, mm -hmm. you know, we focus a lot uh, on um, those very vocal, forthright, uh, unapologetic, if you will, persons who support, sustain, uh, wittingly and unwittingly, uh, white supremacist narratives. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I always use as an example, as we know, the uh, PRRI, uh, Public Religion and Research Institute, re revealed after the 2016 election that, uh, as well as Pew studies, revealed that over 80 some percent of uh, white evangelicals supported the Make America Great Again vision and its candidate. Mm -hmm. People expected that, but what, what we tended to ignore is that so too, did over 50% of non-evangelical white mm -hmm. Christians, mm -hmm. and so too did almost 60% of white Catholics, mm -hmm. which means that the majority of white Christian America supported the Make America Great Again vision and its candidate. Mm -hmm. And in those, all, that majority aren't these people that we would find carrying yeah. forth the white Christian nationalist banner yeah, yeah, yeah. during the insurrection last year on Capitol Hill. We are talking about quote unquote, good white Christians. These, these Christians who, white Christians who ordinarily would mm -hmm. be in support of social justice kind of realities and, and they are, mm -hmm. and, and that would not consider themselves uh, racist. But what is it? What mm -hmm. is it? that uh, has allowed them, particularly when it comes to these issues of anti-Blackness and race matters, to uh, not be as all in uh, uh, as we might uh, expect them or want them to be. And it's not because of, uh, it seems to me, uh, this uh, reality of, of, of sort of being a proclaimed racist or not mm -hmm. being aware of mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of the anti-blackness and white supremacy and not being uh, and being unwilling to discuss it or engage in the difficult conversations about something else. And that's where this white mm -hmm. gaze uh, becomes uh, mm -hmm. very important. And, and, and it shapes the way in which uh, good white Christians sort of live out and into their faith. And so somehow we have to unravel that, call them to mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. And uh, I try to do that uh, in, in this book in concrete ways and point to the ways in which good white Christians, whiteness has mm -hmm. uh, limited their uh, understanding of really the incarnational radicality of mm -hmm. uh, God's love as it comes to us through a Jesus who was crucified. Well, that le leads into something I wanted to discuss, which is sort of the, the, the second part of the book, uh, which is a little more theological and also a little bit more personal uh, because uh, it reflects, you know, a, a kind of personal journey of faith and wrestling with doubt and these kind of questions for yourself about what is the credibility of, 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 of the gospel, you know, if it's if if it if it if it lends itself in some way or through you know over Christian history to be uh, distorted or corrupted in this kind of way, uh, and you know raising very personal questions for yourself prompted some as you said your, your son was asking questions that you were uh, putting to yourself, uh, but you do end on on a note of resurrection resurrection hope. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that journey? Yeah, and let's let's hope that it's not simply a naive hope, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, the point of the matter is, is we do have a, a crucified savior um, at the center of, of our faith. And I have often said 
uh, that uh, we have to take that seriously. And in taking that seriously, you know, I have uh, often said as well and wrote about uh, extensively in uh, Stand Your Ground that that means we have to see this crucified savior in the face of uh, a George Floyd, mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, that what we are talking about are 21st century crucifixions. Mm -hmm. What I came to really understand or the, the conflict, the tension even more was okay, <laughs> but uh, is this not a way of saying that we have to sacrifice Black life if we're going to get to a point of justice where Black life does matter uh, in this country? Are we calling for the sacrificial death of Black life? Are we getting used uh, as uh, Patricia Kohler's of uh, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter said, are we getting used to used to black death in this country? Mm -hmm. And is that what the crucifixion calls us to this point of a sacrificial victim? Uh, and I had focused a lot on that, but trying never to talk about the, uh, the uh, black life or that there was power in the blood, if you will. Uh, but I recognized that indeed I was kind of trapped in that. And, and we can, and if we look at the way in which George Floyd's uh, really 21st century lynching gave way to all of these uh, Black Lives Matter protests across the country, we can suggest that his death was a catalyst for that. And I didn't want to get stuck in that model. <laughs> uh, to, and that was Robert really, the, the tension uh, for me and where do, you, where do you really go from here and we find ourselves still in this reality of, of black death, when's the resurrection? Uh, to where's justice? As my son said, okay, it's well, all well and good that Christ is black, but what difference does that make for us right now? What difference is it making for us? And so I had to find my way through that uh, and really did not know uh, where I was going to end up uh, with that. And that was the scary part of this journey for mm -hmm. me. And you traveled some of this journey through the book with me and I got lost in it. Uh, and in some places trying to really figure out uh, not simply who I was as a theologian, but how I was gonna get my way through the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think ultimately that's what we have to uh, uh, navigate uh, as, as Christians is the cross uh, and how I was going to get my way through the cross. Uh, and, and it took uh, more than sort of thinking my way through it in my head at one point, which I tried to do, and you, 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 you pulled me out of my head, and, and, and that it was more than this abstract journey in my head that I had to, to live into my own experience and journey of faith, my own experience of, of the cross. And, and was I able to move in my own realities as a black person, as a black mother, uh, through the reality of the cross calling, calling us in, in some ways into this time of death and crucifixion. And as, as you, you uh, I, put forth in the book, my only way out of it was to find, and, and I did, I literally uh, prayed about this and uh, literally was reminded of the story of Jesus calling the disciples as they were stuck in their crucifying realities, uh, calling them back to Galilee. And mm -hmm. I literally had to find my Galilee. Mm -hmm. uh, and that Galilee was in the Black Lives Matter uh, protests and I, and I went down uh, put on my little mask and went down to Black Lives Matter Plaza, not knowing, not expecting anything, just being there. Uh, and it was in that moment that the reality of the resurrection uh, became real uh, for me as people were continuing to resist the realities of the cross. And for me now, it's 
not a matter. <laughs> you know, I think mm -hmm. now in this moment, in this conversation of Martin Luther King saying, I may not get there with you, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but I know we're going to get to the promised land. Mm -hmm. And and that's it's just in this conversation that actually that came to me and mm -hmm. to, to recognize even more intensely what he was saying. May not get there with you. I may not see it, but I know we're going to get there. And that's what I had to come to that, you know what? I may see more George Floyds. I hope not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we may not get there in my lifetime, but that doesn't mean I don't continue to fight and live into it. Into this, the and, and not to give in. If if I did, if I believed, and gave in and gave up, uh, to me that's giving into the cross. And uh, and so uh, that a lot of that came to me in that moment of mm -hmm. being at Black Lives Matter Plaza and seeing people who really, really, really believed that the fight for Black lives to matter mattered <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that it would make a difference. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been out there risking their lives in the middle of the pandemic to fight for Black lives to matter. And that came to me. And, and, and as you know, uh, I was reminded in that moment as uh, of that, which I'm always reminded of and, and in a personal way of the folks who were my ancestors who were enslaved and they fought for freedom, even though they knew they would not get there with us, right? And they fought for freedom anyhow, even when they knew that they would never breathe a free breath. Mm -hmm. And they continued to risk their lives for freedom. And because they did that, I am sitting here talking to you with the freedom to write a book. Uh, and they would have never imagined that. My grandmother would have never imagined that. She could, I, I, I wish that I had my grandmother in front of me now and, uh, and she's looking at her granddaughter who, with uh, 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 a PhD and she just wanted us to finish high school could have never imagined that and so that that to me uh is that became real uh for me as i tried to make my way through the cross uh to the resurrection and resurrection realities that we as we live them isn't about perfection uh and getting to that perfect place of god's justice but it is about never giving up and keeping uh that promise of god's justice uh, alive. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kelly. It has been a privilege, uh, an honor to accompany you on this journey. I, I, I've learned so much from you and I always draw so much inspiration from you. So everyone I hope will, will seek out this uh, book, Resurrection Hope, A Future Where Black Lives Matter and find Kelly Brown Douglas's other books also on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. <laughs>